Hello, welcome everyone. We're going to get started in just a minute. We have a few people who are joining us uh, still for the slideshow. So you can give us, uh, put in the chat where you're joining us from today. I will say I'm Charles Krusikoff. I'm in uh, Victoria, British Columbia, on the traditional territories of the Lekwungen and Schwepsen people. And I'm going to be giving an overview at the start of the American Center for Mongolian Studies and our field school, and then we'll be turning it over to the, the teachers. And we have two of our teaching groups today. But so, Janice, uh, hello, welcome. One of our veterans, maybe you can even uh, jump in and we can get you to talk about your experience before. Anytime. I'm always happy to talk about my experience. Hi, Gigi. I was in Makwaka and I was in Makwaka and I'm on Mushwa Billy. Um, I can't. <laughs> okay, we've got people from all over the U.S. and uh, Thailand. Dan Miller joining us from Thailand. Um, Maryland. Great. There's a, for those of you in Maryland, you know that there is a Mongolian Studies Conference this weekend in Washington, D.C. If you haven't heard about it, it's up on our website uh, with some information about that. Uh, mm, beautiful. Well done, Bater. <laughs> <laughs> How is the smoke this year? You're muted, Isaac. So Isaac Sorry, Hart, did, did the, director the, of Ulaanbaatar. The air pollution hasn't been that bad this year. Uh, the temperature is 10 to 15 degrees above normal. So I think when it's a little warmer than normal, the, the wind blows around and keeps the pollution down. So, but don't worry, by summer, it's warmer. It'll be okay. <laughs> Okay, as I said, I'm Charles Krusikoff. Uh, I've been working in Mongolia. We were just talking about uh, spending a long time in, in Asia. I first went to Mongolia in 1989 and, and started working there in 1992, uh, and then founded the American Center for Mongolian Studies, uh, which is now going to celebrate this summer. We're going to have a celebration for our 20th year of our office and our programs uh, in Ulaanbaatar. And so um, in 2019, We've been hosting a lot of uh, faculty and student groups over the years. And in 2019, we created our formal ACMS Mongolia Field School and Janice, one of our uh, participants in our first year. Um, and so we've been running the program since then with a bit of an interruption for the, for the pandemic. And so what we'll do is I'll go over a bit on the background of the field school. These are some pictures from previous years from the field school and, and who the ACMS is and some of our other programs. And then we'll go through each of the courses um, for this year. Okay, so our, our office, as I said, we were founded in uh, 2002 and our office in Ulaanbaatar opened in 2004. We're the American Center for Mongolian Studies because we received some support from the US government through their Fulbright programs or international affairs programs, but we're an independent nonprofit. Uh, um, and we receive funding from our member institutions. So we have universities and museums and other institutions that are members, individual members. So I'd encourage everyone to become a member of the ACMS and make sure you get all of our information about different programs and activities. Uh, coming up, as I said, just this weekend, there's a, a, a Mongolian studies conference in Washington, DC. In the middle of March, we'll be in Seattle at the Association of Asian Studies Conference and, and, and hosting some events there. Um, but our main activities are in Mongolia, where Isaac joined us in the fall uh, as our resident director. So Isaac, do you want to just introduce yourself? Yeah, morning, everybody. Well, morning here anyway. Um, as Charles mentioned, I just moved here in November to serve as the ACMS resident director. And I will also be a co-instructor on the course that Will is about to talk to, um, Dr. Taylor, uh, who has just joined us from University of Colorado in Boulder. And I'm really excited for the summer sessions. They're gonna be 
super fun and really cool and interesting. And um, I've already had, we've had a lot of applicants already, you know, seasoned professionals, um, even academics, um, you know, lifelong learners, a, a range of people have, have expressed interest and applied for these field schools. So they're going to be really fun with a really diverse pool of, of people. Um, it'll be a really cool experience. Yeah, and we, I mean, and the field schools are open and, and we're interested in everyone, whether you've ever been to Mongolia before, this could be your first introduction to Mongolia. We have a number of people who are, who have a lot of experience in Mongolia and would just want to dive in deeper. And so I think that that mix of people is really great as well, because it allows you to both uh, get a fresh perspective on the country and then also uh, to learn from people who are experts. So we run a, a number of programs through the ACMS. We have a staff uh, in Ulaanbaatar, along with Isaac, our Mongolian staff, uh, who will be supporting our programs this, this summer. And then I'm going to go over some of our, our programs. For example, uh, we have a field research fellowship, which is funded by the U.S. State Department. Uh, this is for American scholars uh, who are do, want, interested in doing research work in Mongolia. So uh, generally in the summertime for uh, four to six weeks uh, types of projects or research projects that different people are working on. So if you're interested in that, the information on our field research fellowships and our deadlines coming up uh, for the field research fellowships and as well for our summer Mongolian language program. And based on the, the way that our, our scheduling for our field uh, school courses this summer, it is possible to do the language program or a field research fellowship and one of our courses. So if that's something that interests you, uh, that is, is possible as well. So if you're interested in that, you can, we can talk with you about it and, and let us know. Uh, our, our summer language program, we have, look, there's an excellent student, Will Learning Mongolian mm -hmm. from Selma, our excellent teacher uh, in, in Mongolia. But uh, please look at that information and always just contact us if you have any questions. And we have a special project because we run a library. We have more than 5,000 books in our library in Mongolia. So if you're in Ulaanbaatar and you want to learn more and read some of the great scholarship, most of our books are in English, uh, books about Mongolia. I think we have the largest English language collection about Mongolia and topics related to Mongolian studies. And so we run a special program for librarians because we work closely with different Mongolian libraries. Uh, to do training and to connect, uh, to build resources and, and uh, support for Mongolian librarians, because this is a subject and topic that we find is important for both uh, Mongolian scholars and international scholars who are working in the country. So we have a special fellowship for that. Now, our 2024 field school uh, so our field school was first held in 2019, and then we did our, our online field school. We had to postpone in 2020, uh, and then we did it online in 2021. And then in the last two years, we've had classes on site uh, in Mongolia. Uh, Janice, you, you are joining us, and you were such a great participant as teacher, and you did some interesting uh, materials that came out of that 2019 program. Uh, do you want to talk a little bit about your experience Uh well, sure. I'm always ready to talk about my experience. You know that. Um, I, I am a teacher. I'm a public school teacher, elementary school teacher. And that was my first time in Mongolia. It was the first field school. And I've been on a lot of study uh, of research trips to other countries. And I have to say that that program was the best organized and most interesting I've been on because the participants were so varied. It was about half people from Mongolia and half people from North America and elsewhere. And the the level of training and discussion, the ability to meet people in country and to talk about topics with people from a really wide range of backgrounds was absolutely invaluable. We got to see a lot of places, but also talk to a lot of different kinds of people. And I learned an enormous amount um, I used it to produce a website for teachers, which is still used by about, I don't know, about 20, 30 people a month, which is pretty good for something geared to elementary school teachers. Not many people work on Mongolia with kids. And I really talk about it a lot. I use it a lot in my teaching. So it was absolutely an extraordinary experience. 
Thanks, Janice. And maybe in the chat you can post the uh, the link to your to your website that you created. Um, yeah, we did have a number. I mean, that was one group of of people that were participating was 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 teachers. Uh, as you said, we had a number of of people that were just lifelong learners. They wanted to come and and do it rather than just take a tourist trip in a way to Mongolia. Do a real educational trip. You'll get a lot of the experiences. You get to ride horses and do different things, but then you also get to do a deep dive into to topics with real experts that we'll hear from later today uh, in Mongolia. And then I think one thing that distinguishes this and is very different, I know when I did study abroad, when I was in university in the US and uh, even took student groups abroad, it was always just a bunch of American students going and, and going to visit different countries. And we, we tried to do this very different. We tried to bring in a lot of Mongolian participants. We have a whole Mongolian teaching team who's, who's leading one of our courses and we'll have Mongolian uh, co-teachers in all of the different programs uh, and 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 then Mongolian students will be joining all of the programs. So I think that that sort of mix that mixing an intercultural piece uh, and and learning and experiencing together is a very important part of our program. Now our programs are in English uh, because not all of our Mongolian is strong enough, but uh, we will be using translators and and visiting um, people having both experts, uh, uh, government officials and local officials, and then also visiting families and and people in the countryside. So we'll be doing translation and and, and doing a lot of work. But of course, our Mongolian uh, counterparts and participants will be doing a lot of the cultural interpretation uh, for the international visitors who are coming to Mongolia as well. And our program is open to anyone from any country. We welcome you to to join us. That's part of what's really fun and interesting is people coming from around the world. So uh, our summer field school classes that you'll hear about, first session, uh, sort of an eight day long class, Forces in History, um, and, and I'll turn it over in a minute to Will uh, and Isaac to talk about, about their course. And then we have two courses that will run uh, simultaneously. So you'll choose one of the two. And so we've set these up so that timing wise, if you wanted to do the Horses in History class and then stay on, and do one of the second set of classes, that's quite possible as well. You just let us know in your application that you're interested in that. And so when we look at fellowships, uh, it is possible to, to, to have a fellowship for both courses. Um, you can take just one class, that's fine as well. And then a lot of people come and have their own uh, travel experience either in Mongolia or in the region before or after the course as well. So we'll have about 20 participants we're expecting in each of the classes, and that will include both the international participants and Mongolian participants. And then we'll have a teaching team. So we have our teachers. We also have our translators and support people who are along on the trip. Uh, the courses uh, is in English. So everyone who participates will need to have a level of English um, to understand and to participate and engage in the course. Uh, you do not have to have experience previously in Mongolia, but what we found is a lot of people maybe have a lot of experience. Uh, we've had a number of people who are PhD researchers in Mongolia, but maybe they're researchers in a different field and they just really find this interesting. Once you get to Mongolia, of course, you get very interested in all of the different aspects. Of course, you want to learn about the Taki horses. You want to learn about the history of Mongolia, the archeology, span the deer stones. You see all of these things when you're there and learning about the broad scope is something that's very interesting. So the way that it will work is participants can make their own travel arrangements to get to Ulaanbaatar. And then we will, when you pay the fee and all and participate in the course, we will cover everything from uh, when you arrive in Ulaanbaatar in terms of the hotel starting from when the course starts. And if you arrive a bit early, we can help you find a hotel, either in the hotel that we'll be using or in a different hotel. Uh, and then we'll do all of the, the um, transportation and most of your meals and everything during the course of the study. A lot of each of the programs we really try to get out into the countryside after a few days orientation in Ulaanbaatar. So we will organize all of that for you and, and, and you will basically go from Ulaanbaatar 
out to the countryside for your experience, and then we'll return back to Ulaanbaatar. So the tuition, because the first uh, course is a little bit shorter, is, is $1,750. And uh, for the second course, $3,500. So that includes, again, the instruction, the translation, your meals and housing and everything during the course of the, 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 the dates that the course is, is running. Now we have a special sponsorship and support from the Henry Luce Foundation, which we greatly appreciate. And we are giving fellowships for participants based upon merit and need. And we have a short application that we ask, an essay that we ask you to fill out if you're interested in applying for a fellowship for the program. And because we want to let people know and we need to allocate our fellowship money, you uh, can be considered for a fellowship if you express your interest and apply by March 30th so that we can let people know because people have a strong question about whether they received a fellowship uh, for the program and their applications. So we will be trying to do an admission to the program on a rolling basis. So if you turn in your application next week, we can let you know fairly quickly uh, that you meet the requirements of the program and that, that you've been accepted. The fellowships will wait until March 30th and see how many people uh, apply for a fellowship and compare that with the amount of money that we have. And we're going to try to give everyone that we can the maximum amount of fellowship that's possible uh, given our pool of fellowship funds. So please uh, apply by the priority deadline if you're interested in a fellowship. The final field school application deadline is, is May 30th so that we can get everything set up for our camps and, and hotels and everything in the field. Uh, some people uh, apply for funding from other sources, um, such as if you're in a university, sometimes universities have opportunities for people to get funding through uh, special programs to encourage people to study abroad or to uh, have ex special experiences during the summers. Um, it's a fairly straightforward application. The information is on our, our website uh, at the mongoliacenter.org. Uh, statement of interest, a little bit about your experience in remote areas. This is just to make sure you understand we are going in Mongolia when you go out to the rural areas. Uh, we don't have all the comforts of home. We generally will be staying in camps uh, where there will be showers, partly usually warm water uh, available. Uh, there will be the, the meals and things, but you know, sometimes in the country in Mongolia, the breakdown will be in, in fairly remote areas. You just have to be ready for that. And it can be difficult if you have special needs or special accommodations. We can try our best to support those, but we can't always guarantee, for example, disability access in some rural areas. Um, your CV and your personal details. And if for students, especially if you want to submit a letter of recommendation, we will accept that it's, it's optional. Uh, fellowships, as they say, will be given based upon financial need and merit. We want to encourage people like school teachers that uh, my wife is a school teacher. So we, we love school teachers. Uh, we want to encourage uh, a wide set of people to participate. So, you know, please submit your fellowship applications. Uh, Mongolian applicants, it's a similar thing. We have special scholarships available for Mongolian applicants that bring the uh, cost of the program down significantly for Mongolian citizen applicants. Academic credits, um, in general, what has worked best in the past is that people have been able to get academic credits directly from their own institutions. So this is basically equivalent to a, a, a two week class is equivalent to a six credit oh. university class. And we can um, we can uh, help you to organize, say, a research project or a research paper that you would do through the, the program. Um, we can talk further if you are interested in academic credits. We may also be able to work with a local institution such as the National University of Mongolia to, to try to get credits as well. Um, so if you're interested in academic credits, let us know. I know that for financial aid, sometimes it's important. And that goes for our language school as well, uh, which you can also, we, we're not a accredited 
academic institution to give credits, but we can make sure that you get credits to meet whatever requirements that you need. Uh, safety and health in Mongolia. So right now, Mongolia uh, is is open if you're a, a, from most countries, uh, but definitely from the US, Canada, uh, European countries, etc. You will be able to travel to Mongolia, no problem. You don't need to get a special visa in advance. If you have any questions, you can double check the requirements and we can help you if you need to apply for a visa. Uh, Mongolia is fairly safe in terms of COVID-19. Of course, this disrupted the program for a couple of years. Mongolia was really closed uh, in part because China was completely closed. Russia, of course, has been closed to travel uh, because of the, the um, war and the political situation. Um, most people are flying from either Turkey or from uh, Seoul, uh, depending on which direction from the Eastern US, come a lot of people coming through Europe or through mm -hmm. Turkey and people coming in um, through Seoul or Asia if you're in the Western part of the US. Uh, you should double check uh, and look always at the State Department or other um, sort of travel restrictions and things. Um, some people were telling us that it's cheaper. You can look and say, okay, I'm flying from Chicago to Ulaanbaatar and look at the plane uh, cost for that. But you might also want to check Chicago to Seoul and then Seoul to Ulaanbaatar as separate trips. Some people are finding it cheaper to look at the flight legs separately. The costs of, of travel to Mongolia, unfortunately, have gone up in, in recent years. But this summer, they have the Visit Mongolia. You may have seen Mongolia was the number one uh, travel destination. Uh, who was that? It wasn't Lonely. This year, Lonely Planet has chosen, but there is um, one of the other uh, travel travel uh, services was talking about Mongolia being this is the number one travel destination this year. It's, it's going to be quite popular, but they've really added a lot of flights. Mongolia is encouraging people to, uh, to come. Uh, so uh, ACMS then on ground while you're there, we're going to do our best to keep you healthy, safe. Uh, we have a safety health risk management plan for you. And if you have any concerns or questions about your uh, health condition, uh, we can talk with you about that. And we can try to make sure that the resources would be available, that you understand, and maybe you can communicate uh, with a local clinic if you need to, or someone, uh, if that's something that is of concern. Um, you will be uh, asked to have travel insurance plan because of course, when you travel abroad, you want to have a travel insurance plan with evaluate evacuation insurance in place, um, because while Mongolia's medical system has improved, it still does not meet the same standards that you would get uh, in the United States or even surrounding countries like Japan or Korea. Now, you will have a great time. You will we go to the countryside. It's hard not to have a really good time in the Mongolian countryside in the summertime. It's nice. It's not going to be minus 26. There's not going to be any smoke. There's going to be blue skies. Occasionally it rains, get thunderstorms, beautiful thunderstorms sometimes, but uh, you will see a lot of open grasslands and space. Uh, a lot of uh, the animals. Here's some a small picture of the Taki horses from one of our previous trips. So uh, I think that, you know, you're going to have an amazing time. So these are just pictures from our previous field school. I led a course there on renewable energy uh, a couple of years ago. We've had courses on migration, courses on uh, mining and mining impacts. And we uh, try to constantly evolve our courses forward. So we're thinking about 2025. If there's a topic that you're interested in, let us know. And uh, oh, wow. Okay, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Will and Isaac, and, and you guys can talk about uh, your specific course. Cool. Um, well, thanks, everybody, for being here. Um, it is a really nice opportunity just to get to meet folks that are interested and chat a little bit um, about the, um, the summer course. So I'm Will. Uh, I am here. They just closed the building. And I have to use my code. Uh, I'm a curator of archaeology at the uh, Museum of Natural History here at the University of Colorado. Um, I've been working in Mongolia since my first 
summer doing ACMS field research stuff in 2010 or 11, I guess it was. Um, and for the last probably six years, Dr. Hart and I have led um, some archaeological research in, into kind of the origins of animal pastoralism in Mongolia. Um, we have, since that first moment in 2011, also had the chance to work with uh, Dr. Bayer Sachan, who um, is one of the, you know, leading thinkers in kind of understanding the human past in Mongolia. So uh, there's kind of a star-studded cast of um, interesting folks that will be um, helping to lead this program besides me. Um, and if you don't come for listening to me ramble, definitely come for these these other two. So um, just my background, I'm an archaeozoologist, and I primarily focus on the understanding horse domestication and horse uh, sort of transport and technology and the ways that it's shaped uh, both the ancient world and the world that we live in today. So I don't actually remember what the sequence of slides are here, but why don't we advance and see what what the next one is to surprise us. Yeah, so I kind of cut my teeth, um, if you will, in archaeology, um, studying Mongolia's first uh, sort of true horse culture. You might have seen in your sort of investigations or perusings these extraordinarily striking images of something called deer stones shown here in the photo, right? Um, these are one of the oldest archaeological cultures in Mongolia and absolutely among the first um, linked with domestic animals. Um, and from our research at sites like um, the one you, you see here, uh, have helped to understand this as sort of moment zero for the launch pad of Mongolia's um, incredible, unique um, relationship with domestic horses. Uh, that sort of from there would begin to shape um, the, the entirety of, of human history across East Asia and ultimately Eurasia and beyond. So um, my uh, PhD work uh, focused on understanding horse domestication through the study, scientific study of horse remains that we excavated from around these, these um, deer stone sites. Go ahead and go forward. Um, through the course of this relatively short um, field course here, and I, I should note that it's likely to be an, a day longer than was maybe indicated on the slide there. We we're finalizing, trying to make sure that there's not every day spent, you know, in a transit somewhere, but that we really get a chance to get outside of Ulaanbaatar and into the heart of the step. So our program is going to take us first to um, kind of the, the classic um, heartland of the Mongol Empire, a place that really at one time was the, the true beating heart of the ancient world in visiting um, the ancient Mongol capital of Karkorum. And uh, not just like the museum and that sort of thing, but, but really um, get to understand the the grand kind of Orhan Valley and the sort of Valley of the Kings, if you will, for, um, for ancient Mongolia that it contains. So these are ruins of ancient cities. These are cemeteries linked with almost every important time period in, um, you know, Mongolia's past. So, uh, we're going to really understand, uh, you know, the way that horse cultures built, um, an ancient Mongolia that situated the steps at the center. We're also um, going to carry through our understanding of Mongolia's past into the modern era. So one of the cool and interesting experiences, it's going to be kind of new for me too, um, is we're going to visit the family of somebody whose grandparents ran the very last Pony Express station in northern Mongolia and who still 
you know, um, nowadays he has a, you know, a really nice sort of camp that we'll visit and stay at. But um, he also carries with him an understanding of the ways that just a blink of an eye in a sort of archaeological perspective ago, horses used to form the the infrastructure that connected um, these incredibly vast distances across the ancient world. So we're gonna we're gonna visit the site of Mongolia's last Pony Express sort of station. We're gonna spend some time thinking and discussing and engaging with the ways that Mongolia's relationship with domestic horses um, sort of uh, left a legacy or or a footprint that um, is still very much alive in the day-to-day -day around us, especially in Mongolia. But even as you, you know, leave Mongolia and, and move outwards into, you know, whether it's the United States or I saw India or wherever you are today, that, that legacy very much alive. So along the way, we're going to see a lot about Mongolia's contemporary horse culture, you know, the ways that horses are raised and ridden and managed, um, the kind of cool technology that's used, um, you know, the cultural events that that horses um, are used in today. So summer's a great time to be in Mongolia if you like horses. There's going to be opportunities um, to get up on a horse for those that are excited about that. Um, if you're, you know, just want to learn and and don't want to participate, you know, of course, that's, that's fine too. But I think this will be, um, we're going to tour you through some of the most important places in Mongolia's ancient relationship with horses and think about the impact that that leaves us with today. So it should be an exciting time. Like I said, it's not just going to be me. We'll have experts, um, you know, Dr. Hart, Dr. Bayer Sajan, um, and uh, we should be able to give you a pretty, you know, uh, culturally diverse take on this issue. We've all been working together for many years. And so, um, you know, hopefully we'll be able to kind of build upon that experience and share with you um, a kind of an experiential um, and not purely academic take on that ancient world. So, um, Isaac, anything else? And then I can answer. I see some. <laughs> One of the saddles which you may encounter, I see a chat, a note in the chat, um, is, you know, a, a man famous for slinging saddles across uh, the Pacific Ocean there. Uh, I buy, bought my own saddle from Dan Miller, who's in the <laughs> in the Zoom room here today. And uh, Zan, I don't know if we're going to provide saddle-based discounts, but we can definitely talk it over. So <laughs> Isaac, anything else I need to, um, to weigh in on here before we open for questions or that sort of thing? Uh, I think you've covered pretty much the whole thing. Yeah. The, um, I, I just can't tell everyone how excited I am for this course. It's going to be super fun. And a lot of things that I haven't seen before we're going to see on this trip um, and sites that I know about and have known about for a long time, but haven't yet had the chance to visit. So I'm really excited about this course. I mean, basically what we designed, because I'll be honest, I didn't really want to teach a field course. So basically what we designed is a thing that included all the things I would most want to do related to horses in the ancient world. So I think we're going to have a lot of fun as well, and it will be a truly enjoyable experience. Yeah. And I think that that's definitely true. All of these field courses are, are, are intended to be fun for everyone. These are not like a canned course that someone is just doing. We're out there because we find it really interesting and the topic's really engaging. And I see all of these and think, oh my goodness, I really want to do this. And this is one, this Hustai National Park, I visited a few times, and uh, Serma has, has helped us out on some other classes in the past, and this, this uh, being able to, to uh, participate and really go behind the scenes in a way and understand both the wildlife and the conservation management that's going on with this very famous uh, situation of the reintroduced reintroduction of the Taki horses into Mongolia, and then the management of the park and how you manage a park in a place like Mongolia, where you know the boundaries, of course, of the park uh, and the and the local people um, are somewhat fluid. And this has lessons for for all over. Uh, very timely 
for the Western United States or Canada, where I live, uh, of how they're going to manage wildlife and, and work with nature in both the park and uh, setting and, and, and in people's lives. So, Serma, uh, I will turn it over to you. And do you, are you going to advance your own slides or do you want me to do it for you? Uh, would you do it, do it for me? Okay. Okay. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for participating in this uh, information webinar about ACMS 2024 Field School Program. Um, I'm, uh, my name is Tirma Niemdala. Uh, I'm leading Osta National Park uh, Field School this year. First, uh, I will provide a brief introduction of myself and other five instructors since they are not uh, available for today's webinar. Uh, now let me introduce myself. Uh, uh, I'm working as a uh, as an instructor in the Department of Public Administration at National University of Mongolia. Also, I'm a PhD candidate in Natural Resources and Sustainability Program at uh, University of Alaska Fairbanks. Currently, I'm completing a research on implementation of uh, community-based natural resources management principles for uh, protecting the buffer zone rangelands at Hosta Nation Park, Mongolia. The next instructor is Dr. Usukchargal Dorj. He is a professional uh, biologist and uh, he has been working as a wildlife and wild horse biologist and research and training manager at Hosta Nation Park, Mongolia since 2003. His research uh, focuses on wildlife dynamics and ecology. The next uh, instructor is Mr. Biam Dorch. He holds um, key rules as director at Mon Green LLC and Mon Premier International LLC. His um, exper expertise encompasses nature conservation, protected area and buffer zone management and ecotourism. Um, he, has, uh, he has previously worked as a buffer zone manager at Hosta National Park, Mongolia between 2005 and 2015. And uh, next we, we will have uh, Mr. Oum Bayer Gambot. He has been working as a wildlife biologist and protection manager at Hosta National Park since 2012. Specializing in uh, carnivore studies, he excels in law enforcement, law regulation and conservation planning. Currently pursuing a PhD at Mongolian University of Life Science. He's uh, dedicated to studying wolves in the park. Next instructor is uh, Dr. Sirin Dolom Sirin Ocho. She works as a uh, botanist at the uh, park, specializing in a botanical uh, branch. She has gained expertise uh, through active participation in the field training and studies, including ecological field methodology, vegetation monitoring research, nutritional analysis, and initiatives focused on improving and uh, degraded pastures. And we will have a, a, an assistant during the field school. Uh, Mr. Batsayat Soft will play assistance role. He has been working as a wildlife and uh, wild horse biologist at the park. His scientific uh, pursuit involves studying wildlife populations and examining ecological factors influencing their distributions and numbers. Presently, he is a, a PhD candidate at the Department of Biology at the uh, National University of Mongolia. Before uh, delving into key aspects of our field school, I will provide a basic understanding of Hosta National Park. Osta National Park is one of the national parks in Mongolia. The park was established to implement the reintroduction of Przewalski horses in Hosta in um, 1992. Przewalski horse is a greater endangered species of horse. The Przewalski horse is also considered to be the last surviving uh, species of wildlife, wild horse in the world. Currently, um, World's large number uh, number of Pirzwaski horse exists in Hosta National Park, 
the past population of Prince was reached uh, uh, 423 in 2022. Then also the park uh, protects other uh, important wildlife, including red deer, Mongolian gazelle, argali sheep, uh, wolves, and uh, marmots. Next slide, please. Mm, the field school focuses on three key aspects. Firstly, participants will explore biodiversity conservation in the National Park, and um, participants will spend valuable time in the National Park by learning its important biodiversity and conservation initiatives. The course offers a great opportunity to, to obtain a comprehensive understanding of park's unique attributes, including its management strategies and innovative wildlife conservation methodologies. Through hands-on um, fieldwork, participants will engage in observation and study of Brzozowski horses, along with other species such as Mongolian elk, gazelles, argali sheep, marmots, and gray wolves. Also, uh, participants will get involved in crucial activities like vegetation biomass assessments, refining their skill in ecological research techniques to effectively collect and analyze crucial data supporting conservation endeavors. Next slide, please. Okay. Uh, the second aspect of our field school is community-based conservation. Through exploring the concept of community-based conservation, we will examine its profound uh, implication within both park and its adjacent uh, buffer zone area. We will uh, witness uh, firsthand the positive outcomes of sustainable resource management on local communities' livelihoods, including herders, by visiting, visiting local enterprises, such as ecotourism enterprises, community-scale uh, cheese factories, and sustainable sheep buckthorn horticulture operations. Additionally, the participants learn about how community-based natural resource management has been implemented within the buffer zone and it, the importance of implementing community-based range and management for the uh, buffer zone protection. Next slide. The third uh, cultural aspect of our field school is related to Mongolian traditional culture. This exhibition will also translate scientific exploration offering a rich immersion uh, experience. Also, uh, participants will partake in traditional festival, visit the river, the uh, Kandam Monastery, and explore the Mongolian uh, National History Museum. The course will uh, provide participants the essence of uh, Mongolia's ancient traditions and heritage by making participants to engage with older families along with pr practicing cultural activities like uh, horse and camel riding, traditional food preparation, and participation in traditional games. Also, participants will uh, witness innovative uh, solutions in action through a visit to Mongolian Bangar dog breeding project, showcasing a traditional approach to combat certification and consider uh, wild rangelands. Yeah, that's all uh, for today's webinar. If you have any questions, let me know. Also, there is uh, Dr. Uh, Miller. He has been uh, into Hostel National Park many times, so uh, he can uh, provide some experience at the park. <laughs> okay, well, thank you, Therma. Um, My name is Daniel Miller. I'm actually not a doctor. I never finished a PhD, but I have long experience in Mongolia, especially as a range livestock person. Mm -hmm. And Hustai National Park is really a, gr or this course is a great opportunity to learn about the Prezhebowski horse, the uh, Taki, other wildlife that's found there, and the vegetation uh, of the park. Hustai is unique because in the core area where they do not uh, allow livestock grazing, the rangelands are in very good condition. It's not overgrazed by livestock. So you get to see some, I won't say pristine, 
but you'll get to see some rangelands that are in you know spectacular condition and in late july when this course is held the flowers will be out the grass will be green and lush it's a great time to be there and also um the uh, headquarters uh, of the park is where i understand uh, the participants will be staying is a great gear camp uh, that's what it's yeah. called you know the yurts uh gear camp to stay at um great food um and just you can just walk out from the park from the headquarters in the evening or or mornings to uh, see things um it's a great opportunity to learn about the herders that are in the buffer zones of the area and how Hustai National Park is really a a new model for wildlife conservation that you know involves the local participants so um just to make a plug for this course, it's a fantastic uh, opportunity to be in a really unique part of Mongolia. Thank you, Daniel. Yeah, and I, I can second that. The first time I visited was just after Julia Roberts was there. Mm -hmm. If any, in, anyone is interested, if you haven't seen it, you have to see Mong uh, Julia Roberts' film about the horses of Mongolia. And she was one of the participants and there, you know, in the guest book is, is Julia Roberts' signature and her comments from uh, her visit to Hustai. And then I know that some of the things you're going to do in the course are things like going out and doing the wildlife counts early in the morning. And I know when I've been in the park and maybe the, the, the baby horses are probably born a little bit earlier in the in the spring, but, uh, you know, seeing the, the new baby horses, the young horses running, uh, it's, it's quite a remarkable experience. And then all of the other wildlife, uh, as was noted, and being able to participate. So the idea is that you all will be actively participating with, these are all the park managers, these are the park leaders, and mm -hmm. you will be going out uh, and actively, you know, participating together on wildlife, vegetation counts, and then this engagement in the buffer zone and really getting to meet people and understand how the two, uh, the park and the local people are working together to protect wildlife, to preserve wildlife. This is something that's very important. I know uh, I've just been reading and, and listening a lot about the in reintroduction of wolves in, in the Western uh, United States, for example and how they're trying to manage uh, potential conflicts between uh, wolves and, and other animals that have been reintroduced and are now coming out of the parks into the, the rest of the lands and working together with local people so that local people who are herders in, in the United States, uh, you know, can, can find ways to reduce impacts and, and on both the wildlife and on their own herd. So, these are topics that I think are very timely and, and will be very, very interesting uh, there. And this is one of the shining star great uh, uh, projects in the world of the reintroduction of wild animals. So Terma, any anything else to, to add? You, you have your experience in Alaska as well. Yep. Mm, I would say uh, if, you are, if you get involved in uh, our field school, we will make sure um, you will have a great time there. And if you have any questions, you can contact me at uh, my e email address here. Yeah, that's great. Thank you very much. And uh, I think this is going to be a fantastic class. And this is, as we said, the, the class that's in the second sort of uh, time period. And we have one other class. We've uh, allowed Ariel and Monkey Erdine to... Uh... Pardon? So we've allowed uh, Ariel and Monk Erdine to, to sleep uh, right now because it's the middle of the night. Ariel uh, what, did join us uh, for the last uh, webinar. So there is a recording uh, of them introducing their course. And next week on February 6th at 2 p.m. Uh, Greenwich Mean Time and London Time, uh, where they are located, they're going to do a, a webinar specifically on this course. And, and we'll talk a little bit about the other courses again as well. But if you want to, if you're really interested in this specific course, you can watch that previous webinar. I'm going to go over the course uh, here and then come join us on February 6th for their webinar. It will be 2 p.m. So that's 2 p.m. Uh, in London or 9 a.m. on uh, in uh, East Coast. United States. So this course is going to run at the same time as the Hustai Park course. So you're going to have to choose. It's going to be a hard choice. 
This one is a little bit different. It's really looking at the step ethnographies uh, where they're using step, uh, where they're using interview, uh, teaching field research interview techniques and participating and embedding you directly in the, uh, in the, the life of people living out on the steppes uh, in Bayan Hongor province. So this is uh, Munk Erdin is, uh, uh, has been at the National University of Mongolia, is now at uh, University of Oxford, and Ariel has been there at the University of Oxford uh, as well. Um, and they've been going regularly to Mongolia to work on different research projects and training projects uh, each year. So uh, they can, uh, you know, they have deep experience. And what they really want uh, to do is really take people on a really embedded experience where you'll be living together with herdsmen in the countryside. You will be uh, riding on the buses and, and, and participating in, in countryside life, cultural activities and other things um, where, uh, you know, I, I think it's going to be a really interesting, unique experience where you really can live a life that you know is 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 vanishing in most of the world. So uh, to identify ethnographic research approaches. So they are ethnographic researchers. They are going to introduce you to the work that they have done, some of the research techniques that they use, and then you will be employing some research and uh, interview techniques, and then um, sort of we would say decoding or or evaluating uh, the information that you're gathering. So then you'll be learning about mobile pastoralism in Mongolia. We say people in Mongolia are not nomadic necessarily, although that word is often used, but people are pastoralists, meaning that they move uh, throughout the seasons to different camps uh, together with their animals. And the sort of interplay between different people. So there's is a common property system. People are moving within a, a landscape, but working together on where they will be setting up their camps. Um, it depends on the weather, it depends on what other people are in the region, sources of water, all of these different things. Uh, so it's very, very interesting to learn how and when do people make moves, how often do they move, how do they make sure that their animals have what they need in terms of grass and water and, and other things. And, you know, sort of the broader space uh, of, of cultural traditions, the environment, the impacts uh, of climate change on the environment, how that is changing herding uh, in Mongolia, the interactions with the economy, uh, the cashmere production, milk, meat production, and how that interplays with, with people in the countryside as well. So then uh, you're going to be bringing that together. And because these two classes are running at the same time, we hope to have kind of a conference seminar where each of the people from the different classes can present back to each other um, uh, we're back in Ulaanbaatar for the last couple of days uh, of the course as well. So I, on the arrow here, it points to Bayan Hongor, which is a province uh, sort of in west, uh, southwest Mongolia, um, which is famous uh, for its, its, its herding, it's famous for its fermented mare's milk. Uh, you'll be going out to that region um, and staying then with, with families there because it's a region where both Monkerdin and Ariel have a lot of contacts and have done a lot of research work in the past. So these are just some, some pictures of the type of, of uh, sites you will see and activities that you will find out in the countryside. So you'll be going out, you know, traveling by public bus out to Bayan Hongor. Uh, then you'll be spending time both in the provincial center and so where you'll be staying part of the time in a hotel or in a, in a gear camp there. And then also having this opportunity for homestays with herder families, which I think is a, a really special opportunity here. You know, most, uh, if you just do a tour in Mongolia, you may visit a herding family, but you will not stay with herding families. And uh, we've had a number of people in the past say that, you know, that's the most meaningful thing to watch, you know, this whole process over the day of people getting up, taking their, taking their herds out into the, the pasture lands, then bringing them back, milking them in the evening, um, all of the different traditional lives and chores and different things that people are engaged in 
and really being able to see that, participate in that. Um, so it's, it, it's a really special experience. Now, as they note, uh, both the, 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 the trip, you know, if you're uncomfortable with travel in rural areas, uh, if you're uncomfortable with living, of course, they don't have a, a, a big shower facility that they carry around with them. So you're going to be staying out in these rural areas. Uh, and the food situation, if you have a very particular food things, I know my son has very a lot of food allergies. That's actually probably manageable because the food in the countryside tends to be milk products and meat products. There are not a lot of vegetables, so it can be a bit challenging if you're a vegetarian. It can be done. There are a number of vegetarians in Mongolia, um, but we'll have to plan ahead a bit and, and, and think about that. But uh, there will be limitations because you'll be staying with families and, and uh, living the life that the families live as well. So uh, here's Munkerdin with their, one of their co-collaborators uh, in the in the Sum area there. So this is their contact information. If you have any questions, uh, you can, can contact them. And as I said, there is a video that they do a much better job of introducing their course. It's posted up on our, our, our website of, uh, for ACMS. Uh, and they are doing their session February 6th at 2 p.m. The link here, if you want to sign up and uh, participate in that session. We wanted to time a session because they're based in, in Oxford. We wanted to time a session that, that's uh, more convenient for people in Europe who are sleeping right now. All right. Uh, happy to take uh, any questions uh, in, the, in the chat or if anyone has, has questions. We really want to, you know, this is, we're, we're all so excited and we all came to Mongolia uh, uh, and, and just fell in love with the country. It's such a beautiful place. The summertime, the big grasslands, uh, you know, if you know the Western US or, or spaces like that, think of it basically without the roads, without the fences, without all of the things, it's, it's what it was uh, many years ago. And with the traditional indigenous lifestyles uh, that people still maintain in, in rural areas. So you'll be going back here, the deer stone, several thousand years in history uh, and up to the present time. So it's gonna be a great uh, opportunity. Uh, we have a lot of information up on our, our website, our Facebook page. So in Mongolia, people love Facebook. Uh, they're regularly, regularly posting. So please, uh, you know, get connected with our Facebook page. Uh, we will be sending you our regular newsletter that we produce this month in Mongolian Studies, which has information about different Mongolia activities. Um, and uh, as we say, then a few years ago, because of the pandemic, uh, we had to cancel the on-site courses, but we made some recordings and we had teachers deliver courses um, online. And so you can see recordings of those courses and access those. Uh, in the 2021, you can go back on our website and see the previous course offerings. So these are more uh, links to different uh, activities, uh, different feeds that we have. But uh, pay Facebook, I would say, and then uh, the website are places that we try to post things. And as I say, we will have represent representatives this weekend in Washington, D.C. There's a Mongolian Studies Conference. Seattle in March. I will be there, uh, with a Nick there and a number of people uh, as well. And uh, we're really, really excited. Um, any other questions? Yeah. Thanks, Laura. Uh, it's it's just a lot of fun. So we hope that uh, we hope that you apply. And we hope to see people in Mongolia. I can say that, you know, if, you, if you've been on tours or even if you've been on study abroad, I think as Janice introduced earlier, you know, this, this is a different experience because it's a, it's a really uh, cross-cultural experience. It's a really embedded experience uh, in the countryside and in a place uh, and, and a countryside that, that really is, is a very, very special in the world today to be able to visit people uh, who are still living 
uh, in these more traditional lifestyles and who uh, are carrying traditions forward in adapting in modern ways. You'll see we taught a course on renewable energy. You know, it, people in the rural areas, you see the, the satellite dish there. Uh, people have uh, their their refrigerators and different things that they run off of solar, off of wind. Uh, you know, it, it's it's people are adapting and it's interesting to to also see and how people are adapting and and uh, coming forward. So. All right. Yes. And please uh, see our website and, and join in. And we're going to be doing the field school each summer going forward and always interested in your ideas of what types of courses and programs and projects. And we have regular speakers online through our speaker series. Uh, both we have speakers who present in Ulaanbaatar, but then also speakers online that we record and and uh, you can watch them live or or participate through Zoom. Um, the conference being held in Seattle, so it's the Association of Asian Studies, the AAS. It's the big gathering of uh, uh, Asia Studies people. So those be like five or six thousand people across all of the disciplines and countries of of Asia who are coming together in Seattle, March fourteenth, fifteenth, sixteenth, seventeenth. So on March 16 and 17, the Saturday, uh, we're going to be having a, a event for, for academics and people who are at the conference about Mongolia. And then on March 17th, together with the Mongolian community and friends of Mongolia who are based in the Seattle area, we're going to have a community event. And so we'll be posting out information. We're just booking the venue for that right now in Shoreline, just north of Seattle. Uh, and we're going to have Mongolian food, Mongolian music, and just a good Mongolian party. Mongols love to party in the summertime. It's a great time to party in Mongolia. But in Seattle, uh, we're bringing that as well. And just looking ahead, we will. Uh, we hope to do uh, some activities this fall in Denver, um, a, a conference which will highlight some of the ways in which the American West uh, and North American West, I should say, I'm here in Canada, uh, and, and Mongolia, the the range of issues from climate change, grasslands, uh, indigenous peoples, the, the traditions, the wildlife, all of these things, uh, management of you know, parks, all of these things cross over and there's a lot to learn between the two regions. So we're gonna be having conference in uh, Denver that looks at that topic, so. We welcome you. We will be, as I say, we're, we're finalizing our venues. We'll post up on our website and on Facebook, et cetera, uh, the exact details of the Seattle uh, meeting. But we hope to 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 see people there. So and uh, feel free, uh, Elizabeth, others to just email us and we're happy to engage uh, and connect with you directly. Thanks, folks. OK, thank you, everyone. Thank you.